Hello everybody, uh, Pastor Sal here, and uh, just uh, is going to be continuing our daily devotional on the book of, by Steve Fry, A God Who Heals the Heart. Of course, I am not advertising the book, nor am I getting any um, royalties from it or anything like that. It's just a, a tool we use for our daily devotional. Um, and so uh, we are in chapter 12 today, or in other words, day 12 of the 40-day uh, uh, devotional and we've been talking about the God who gives the God who hurts um, you know yesterday we had saw a really good example of how God does cry and he does um, you know just in the same way that he cried for Jerusalem uh, and for Lazarus uh, and he does for us too he we break his heart every time we do something that is against uh, his will and so Today we're going to be talking about the God who becomes angry. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a lot, probably. I would we would all probably say from the Old Testament, um, but you know we'll see what this uh, day has in store for us. So the memory verse for today is the Lord's anger burned against Moses. That's Exodus four fourteen. Uh, once again, it's the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And so Steve Fry writes, Who among us has not blown a fuse when some local yokel has cut in front of us in the fast lane going 35 miles per hour? Who among us has not been seized with wild paroxy uh, paroxysms of frustration <clears throat> when we have to explain something important to a desk jockey for the tenth time? And they still don't get it. Or what about the times when you're shuttled from office to office to office in search of one simple little answer to one simple little question? It's enough to make the coolest customer erupt on conniptions or in conniptions. But psychologists tell us that one of the primary reasons we become angry is our perception that our goals are being blocked. Whether it's the promotion we think we deserve or the theater seat we're scrambling for, if someone gets it, gets in our way, we get mad. Somebody pushes us one step too far, or someone irritates us, or another's incompetence frustrates us, and we're steamed. So naturally, when we read of God's anger towards Moses, we view it through these experiences. Moses tr tried God's patience, we say. He pushed God just one step too far. Finally, God became protruded by Moses' stubbornness and burn, and the burning bush heated up. The thought of coming face to face with God's anger generally turns our spines to jelly. Images of fire falling and the earth opening up have a way of arresting our attention. Most of us are scared spitless of his anger, probably because of the way we perceive anger in the first place. We tend to read our emotions into God's responses and conclude, Moses, you pushed God one step too far and now you've made him mad. If someone treated us this way, we tell them where they could get off. But, but it is that, uh, but it is uh, this an accurate understanding of his anger. God was calling Moses to a glorious purpose. He knew things Moses didn't. He saw a future destiny that few people would ever realize in history. He saw Moses confronting the most powerful man in the world. He saw Moses parting seas and bringing water out of rocks. He knew that one day Moses would stand face to face with him on a mountain and receive a law that would ever know the thrill and privilege Moses would know. Yet in the face of inexpressible glory, Moses was in incredulously obtuse, throwing back at God all the reasons why his involvement in the divine plan wasn't such a good idea. So again, uh, God, of course, sees the future, sees uh, his plans, and <clears throat> Moses, instead of just trusting in God, he, he starts to, you know, kind of push his weight a little bit, uh, thinking he has any weight against God, of course. 
And so, of course, he he brings on the anger of God, right? Um, I don't think he necessarily pushed too far. I think it was just more of a God being angry with the fact that he was still, even after everything that God did for him uh, to, to, to free the... Uh, the Jewish people to uh, free them from, bond from bondage, to uh, to do all the things that he did, uh, and yet he was still not fully on board with his plan and not doing being obedient to the point that God needed him to be. So one by one, God patiently deflected all of Moses' excuses. Finally, Moses got honest and said to God, send somebody else to deliver your people. The only response God had left that could pers per preserve Moses's future was his anger. Uh, so he demonstrated in an explosive fashion, his anger burned. But he must understand that God wasn't angry at Moses, he was angry for Moses. His was not the wrath of an indignant monarch, but the intensity of a loving God. He did not want Moses to miss such a destiny. So rather than leave Moses to his mediocre existence, he flashed his anger in an attempt to jolt Moses into obedience. Not because God was so egocentric that he wanted his will done at all costs, but because he cared enough for Moses not to let him miss his opportunity. Okay, so God sometimes is angry because we miss our opportunities, right? Our actions have consequences and uh, it, it upsets God when we don't fulfill what he has for us, right? He doesn't want us to miss it. So the anger of the Lord is not to be avoided. It is to be embraced for it is God's protective love in action. He doesn't get angry at us. He gets angry for us because he doesn't want us to miss the best. God is slow to anger and possesses a, patient be, a patience beyond comprehension. But if through our obstinacy or simple neglect we fail to apprehend the wonderful design God has for our lives and if the only response that God has left is his anger as a means of spurring us into action then let us receive it gladly it is sure a sure sign of his love God's anger may startle us but his indifference would devastate us let me read that again God's anger may startle us, but his indifference would devastate us. So what does that mean? Well, it's better for God to be angry with us because that means he cares and he loves us, just like a parent would, right? When we get mad at our kids, what do we do? We don't, we don't do it out of, uh, out of, to be mean. Well, at least not a loving father and a loving mother doesn't do it out of, uh, to be mean to their son or daughter. They do it because they get angry because they get upset at the fact that they're missing out on something, that they're not doing something the way that they should, right? For for their own good. Because if we didn't care, we would just let them do whatever they wanted, right? And we wouldn't get upset. So that's what it, that's what that uh, example is. That God's anger may startle us, yes, it may scare us, but better for Him to get angry at us because that means He still loves us and He cares, than for Him to not even do anything, right? So Moses encounters God's anger again a little later in the story when scripture simply says that God met Moses on his way to Egypt and was about to kill him. Now, how in the world can you figure that one? Moses was finally being obedient to the will of God and God wanted to kill him. Not much explanation is given except that after Moses' encounter, he immediately circumcised his son. This might be the clue that unlocks what seems to be a very puzzling response on God's part. Four centuries earlier, God had made a covenant with Moses' ancestor, Abraham. It was a promise of unparalleled blessing, but the sign of the covenant was circumcision. Every male of Abraham's descendants was to be circumcised, an interesting sign to say the least. Next time we ask God for a sign, we would be wise to think twice, right? <laughs> right? Because of the circumcision and painful and... Okay, well, you get it. The rite of circumcision was the key that was to release God's blessing to each subsequent generation. 
Of course, this foreshadowed the circumcised circumcision of the heart when a person submits their life to the Lord Jesus Christ and receives the un indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. As much as God would want to bless every generation of Abraham's descendants, unless they fulfill their part of the covenant by circumcising every male child, his blessing could not be given. Okay, so that gives us a little clue as to why Moses did that. It is the same way today. God wants to release blessing on every person in the world, but only those who have been circumcised in heart by being born anew of the Spirit are included in his covenant and are thus in a place to receive those blessings. In other words, now our circumcision is to be circumcised in the heart. In other words, God wants our heart totally. And when we give him our heart or life, everything, then we're born anew and we will be included in his covenant, right? So those blessings will pour down from, from heaven, but we must circumcise our heart. In other words, give our heart totally to him. Okay, that's the key. The fact that Moses had simply neglected to circumcise his son was the occasion of God's response here. But again, it was not one of, king, of a king frustrated with a thick-headed servant. It was love's protection at its highest. For had Moses gone to Egypt without having circumcised his son, I suggest God could not have released the blessing on Moses' ministry. He could not have demonstrated his miraculous signs, not because he wouldn't have wanted to, but because he could not deny his own word. Had Moses attempted any miraculous sign, it would have been disastrous. He would have thrown his rod down and it would have remained a rod. And the people of Israel would have stoned him as a false prophet. So rather than leave Moses to the stones of an unbelieving nation, God met him at the inn and said in his big merciful heart, I'll just have to take him home to be with me. Moses was not accosted by a vengeful deity. Rather, he was arrested by a father of love. You know, we, the, the only, the, the biggest example, again, I can use is, is when, when a parent disciplines his children or, or uh, she disciplines her children. We do it not because, you know, a loving parent doesn't, a loving parent doesn't do it because we want to be mean or, or anything like that. It's because we want to teach them a lesson that they can learn for the future, not because uh, not necessarily because we want things done our way all the time. Yes, that's part of it too. That's that's our humanity of wanting to do things our way only. But at the same time, it's because we care and we love them and we want to discipline them for the future, right? To prepare them for something in the future, uh, to bring the best out of them, right? The, to see, to bring out that potential they have, right? So that's what God was trying to do for Moses is to give him that confidence and to give him, you know, kind of, kind of light a fire in his pants, right, you know, to, to the ministry, uh, because he was going to be facing something very, very, very tough. So, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's kind of how God is a God that does get angry, but it's not an anger because he wants to necessarily destroy us or, or, or it's a, uh, like a king's anger. No, 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 no. This is because he loves us so much that he gets angry at the fact that we're not seeing or we're not trusting in him fully. We must give him our heart and go in with the full trust of God, right? So, uh, and be obedient to him. So to those of us who are his children, we need never dread his hints of anger. It is but another facet of his uncompre uncomprehensible love. And if we don't always be led by his tenderness, let's be grateful that he loves us enough to jar us by his anger to the place where we are walking in our destiny and satisfied by his affections. So let us give thanks to all the things that God gets angry for, right? To, to us, because that means he cares enough to push us in the right direction, teach us a little bit of a lesson just to, to get us in the right direction. And so uh, to get catch our attention, right? Um, 
Because if he was a, a God that was indifferent, then, you know, this world would be an even bigger mess, right? Uh, God forbid that. Right? It's a big mess as it is already. Um, and so uh, we're not being the good stewards that God intended us to be, right? When he gave us, when, in the beginning of creation, he gave us domain over everything, right? Which means that we were to take care of it and to bring the best out of it. And we're not doing that. We're not doing a very good job of that, as, as, as we all know. So uh, we need to sometimes get a little bit jarred, like it says here. So let us pray. I embrace all of the expressions. We embrace all of the expressions of your love, including your anger. It actually makes us feel secure that you love us enough to get angry with us. If necessary, that you love us enough to let us hear the sternness of your voice and sense the agitation of your displeasure. As a preacher once said, you're out to do me good, right? So lead on, O Lord, and help us to remember that your anger is indeed your protective love in action, and that that anger is only to show us that you love us unconditionally and uncomprehensibly, that you love us enough to care, to get angry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so if you need prayer, uh, please, please let us know. Uh, I'll have information down here uh, below. Um, and so, you know, send your prayers to prayer at theridgep.com if you have any questions. Uh, about our church or anything like that, you can uh, feel free to email me at sal, at, that's S-A-L, at theridgeep.com. Uh, you'll see it here below. And so we look forward to seeing you tomorrow uh, for day 13. And you have a great day and God bless.